Hi everyone, it's Tom, WA2IVD. I recently did a couple of videos about a long wire end fed antenna that I put up. I'm using an MFJ926B remote tuner mounted outside at the feed point of the antenna. Yezu, LDG, ICOM, and others make remote tuners that are designed to be mounted outside exposed to the weather. You may have a rig with a built-in tuner or you may be using an external tuner that's in your shack right next to the radio. So what's the advantage of a remote tuner over these examples? The primary advantage is to reduce losses in the feed line between the radio and the antenna. Coaxial feed lines all have losses even if the antenna system is a perfect one-to-one -one SWR match. With higher SWRs, the losses in the feed line cable get worse. QST published an article from K5DVW back in November of 2006 with a nice chart showing how SWR affects coax losses. It also has a chart showing how cable losses can make your SWR at the radio appear to be much lower than it actually is. I've got a link to the article in the description. The ARRL has this article in a public portion of their website, so you don't need to be a member to take a look at this. The bottom line is that for any given antenna and coax, you're going to get the maximum amount of RF power into the antenna by having the tuner as close as possible to the antenna feed point. Now I can hear some of you saying, we'll just use a resonant antenna. That is absolutely the best possible case, and that's the best way to go. Unfortunately, many people don't have the space or the budget to have a resonant antenna for every HF band that they might want to work. All right, we've looked at why to use a remote tuner. Let's take a look at how you set one up. Since these tuners are automatic, we need to have some way to power them when they're out at the antenna. One way you could do this would be to run a power cable from your shack out to the tuner along with the coax. A more convenient option is to use the coax to carry both the RF and the DC power out to the tuner using just one cable. This is possible using something called a bias T. A bias T is a three port device that allows you to inject DC into a coax run and at the same time keep the DC from reaching the radio or the antenna depending on where the T is located. The bias T that came with my tuner is the MFJ4117. And one of the questions that I received in the setup video, or about the setup videos, asked about its function. So hopefully this video will help clear that up a little bit. The bias T that's installed at the shack end of the coax injects DC power into the cable. An identical bias T is installed out at the antenna end of the coax to extract DC power from the cable, in this case, for the tuner. MFJ publishes the schematic for their bias T. The circuit's pretty simple. The DC input or output goes through a couple of choke inductors that block RF from reaching the DC port. Two small capacitors to ground shunt any last bit of RF that might get through. Then there's three 1000 volt capacitors between the two RF ports. These capacitors block the DC voltage from getting to the RF only port while allowing the RF signals to pass. The switch at the DC input allows you to turn off the DC voltage going to the coax. And it turns out this switch can be pretty important and not all bias T's might have a switch. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Now I mentioned that you need to have a bias T at each end of the coax. This is true, but the MFJ 926B, the LDG RT100, and a number of the other remote tuners that are out there have the bias T for their end built into the tuner. So you don't actually need a separate box out at the antenna, but there is a bias T. It's just all inside one unit. In the case of the MFJ tuner, when you remove power, the tuner is automatically bypassed so the radio is connected directly to the antenna. This is a nice feature if you want to just use the antenna, maybe it's on a band that it's already resonant for, you can just disable the tuner so it doesn't get in the way. Now a minute ago I mentioned that the power switch can be pretty important. I have an antenna switch in my setup where the coax comes into my shack. 
in my setup, the coax switch is between the bias T and the tuner and antenna outside. Coax switches often have a ground position where they ground all ports. Some switches will ground all of the ports, including the common port. Some will only ground the switched ports. It's also common for coax switches to ground any port that's not currently selected. The important thing to know is whether your setup has anything that grounds the coax coming out of the RF and DC port on your bias T. If you do, you need to make sure that the power switch on the bias T or your power source is turned off before you ground the coax. Otherwise, your bias T and your 13.8 volt power source in the shack are going to see a dead short at their outputs. And if your shack power includes a large backup battery and you don't have a proper fuse between it, then your power source might actually end up burning up some wires inside the bias T or somewhere else between the bias T and the tuner. Sorry, not between the bias T and the tuner, but between the bias T and where it hits that switch in your shack. One final thing to be aware of with remote tuners. With most of them, you can just start transmitting, whether it's voice, CW, or data, and they'll automatically start tuning if your SWR is too high. Now this is convenient because you just start operating and the tuner takes care of everything. The trouble is that if your transmitter is set to 100 watts, all of the relays in the tuner are seeing that power and probably doing quite a bit of arcing as they open and close while it's tuning. This will reduce the life of those relays and might eventually damage them. Your remote tuner will last a lot longer if every time you make a large frequency change, you take these steps first. Set your radio's output power to around 10 watts or so. Put your radio in a mode that generates a steady carrier. This could be CW with a manual key, AM with no modulation, or on some radios, if you set the mode to RIDI and you just key the mic or push the transmit button, the radio will just transmit a steady carrier. And then finally, transmit a carrier until the SWR indication on your radio, or if you have a separate meter, stops changing. You'll be seeing it moving up and down as the tuner's tuning. And when it settles at the lowest value, now you're tuned and ready to go. And don't forget to identify. WA2IVD testing. Now you set your radio back to full power in whatever mode you're planning to use, and you're ready to go. Many radios also have connectors on them to support an external tuner. In most cases, you can connect a switch and a few components to these connectors and create a tune button that'll just be a separate push button or switch that you put next to the radio. And when you activate that switch, it will make the radio automatically put out a low power solid carrier so that you can tune. And this way you don't need to change any settings on the front of the radio. I'll cover that for some radios in an upcoming video. That's all for this time. If you enjoyed this video or you found it useful, I'd appreciate a click on that like button. If you find the channel useful, please subscribe and be sure to click on the bell icon so you'll get notified when new videos come out. And make sure to check out uh, links in the description. I'll have links in there of those antenna videos where I put up the antenna. I'll have that article. And then there's some links in there for the companion site for this website and some other stuff. As always, I'm Tom, WA2IVD, and this is Ham Radio A to Z.